Good morning, and welcome to the March 2023, just before St. Patrick's Day, open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda today? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you, and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear five items for your consideration. First, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would propose a new regulatory framework for supplemental coverage from space. Through this proposed framework, satellite operators collaborating with terrestrial providers would be able to operate space stations on currently licensed flexible use spectrum to expand coverage to the terrestrial provider's subscribers. Second, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking and order, which would begin the commission's implementation of the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act of 2022. The notice of proposed rulemaking seeks comment on how the commission should interpret the act's language to ensure just and reasonable rates and charges for incarcerated people's audio and video communication services. The order will delegate authority to the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Economics and Analytics to update and restructure their most recent data collection as appropriate to fulfill the requirements of the new statute. Third, you will consider a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would close a critical gap in the stir-shaken call, caller ID authentication regime, expand robocall mitigation requirements for all providers, adopt more robust enforcement tools, and seek comment on additional steps to further enhance the effectiveness of the stir-shaken framework. Fourth, you will consider a report and order which would require that providers block text purporting to be from numbers on a reasonable do not originate list and make available a point of contact for text message blocking complaints. The commission will also consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking, which would propose to require further blocking of illegal robotext, expand do not call protections to robotext, and protect consumers from getting robotext and robocalls from multiple unexpected callers when they provide their consent on websites for comparison shopping. Fifth, you will consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking, which would propose to expand support for individuals who are blind or visually impaired by expanding audio description requirements to additional market areas. The proposal would help ensure that a greater number of individuals who are blind or visually impaired can be connected, informed, and entertained by television programming. This is your agenda for today. Please note item five, title updating equipment testing standards, and items six and seven, enforcement bureau actions, as listed in the March 9th Sunshine Notice, have been adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item is titled Single Network Future, Supplemental Coverage from Space, Space Innovation, and will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the International Bureau. Joel Taubenblatt, Acting Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Taubenblatt, please proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners. Today, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the International Bureau are pleased to present for your consideration an item that would seek to facilitate the integration of satellite networks and terrestrial networks by proposing a new regulatory framework. I would like to thank the team from the Wireless Bureau and the International Bureau for their hard work on this item, as well as other bureaus and offices for their contributions. With me at the table are Neshe Gindelsberger, Deputy Chief of the International Bureau, Carrie Hicks, Associate Chief of the Wireless Bureau, and John Markman, an attorney in the Mobility Division of the Wireless Bureau. John will present the item. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you today proposes a new regulatory framework to enable innovative collaborations between satellite and terrestrial stakeholders. Through this novel approach, satellite operators collaborating with terrestrial service providers would be able to obtain commission authorization to operate space stations on licensed flexible use spectrum currently allocated to terrestrial services to provide supplemental coverage from space, or SCS. This would enable expanded coverage to a terrestrial licensee's subscribers, especially in remote, unserved, and underserved areas, and would increase availability of emergency communications. 
The NPRM's lead proposal would allow SCS where a satellite operator collaborates with a terrestrial licensee that holds all co-channel licenses in a given spectrum block throughout a geographically independent area, or GIA. For example, the continental United States, Alaska, or Hawaii. And where that spectrum has no non-flexible use legacy incumbents requiring interference protection. The NPRM proposes to revise the U.S. Table of Frequency Allocations to provide for non-federal mobile satellite service on a co-primary basis with existing allocations in a defined class of terrestrial flexible use bands. Under the proposed framework, a satellite operator with an existing Part 25 non-geostationary orbit authorization could apply to modify its license to provide SCS if that entity has an application on file to lease the exclusive use spectrum of a terrestrial licensee holding all co-channel licenses throughout a GIA and the terrestrial licensee has a Part 25 blanket earth station application on file covering the subscriber's terrestrial devices. This approach would leverage a combination of Part 25 licensing and the Commission's existing Part 1 leasing framework to facilitate the provision of SCS. The item also seeks comment on whether to amend the Commission's leasing rules to effectuate SCS and on alternative contractual arrangements. The NPRM proposes to apply certain existing service rule obligations for satellite operators and terrestrial wireless providers and seeks comment on the applicability of other rules in the context of the proposed Part 25 licensing framework to authorize SCS. For example, given the potential for SCS to enhance emergency connectivity in remote areas, the NPRM explores how to facilitate access to the nation's emergency response system for customers using SCS, including 911 and wireless emergency alerts. The NPRM proposes that existing signal level limits and international coordination requirements applicable to the proposed terrestrial bands would apply to SCS operations. Because many of the bands proposed for SCS are not allocated for mobile satellite service internationally, the NPRM clarifies that proposed SCS spectrum use would be considered a non-conforming use under ITU radio regulations and operations could be conducted on a secondary non-interference basis to an authorized terrestrial device. The NPRM also seeks comment on authorizing these innovative new operations in bands and locations which do not meet the criteria of our lead proposal, including whether it is possible to enable SCS bands, SCS in bands that host non-flexible use legacy incumbents uh, unrelated to SCS in areas where multiple unaffiliated flexible use licensees operate in a given GIA, but all licensees agree to jointly provide SCS to their customers in cooperation with a satellite provider, and where a, the geographic area of operations contains non-collaborating co-channel licensees requiring interference protection. Finally, the NPRM seeks comment on whether there are any changes to the Commission's rules or processes needed to enable supplemental satellite coverage to terrestrial devices beside the proposed SCS framework, particularly for collaboration using satellites on spectrum already allocated for mobile satellite service to close terrestrial coverage gaps and enhance the provision of emergency services. The Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and International Bureau recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges to make technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. We will start with Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much. Uh, just a few weeks back, I had the chance to go to Barcelona to Mobile World Congress where regulators and industry stakeholders from around the globe gather and discuss some of the latest hot topics in wireless. From the panels to the pull asides, one issue in particular kept coming up, and that was the emerging, the emerging convergence of space and terrestrial mobile services. And it's easy to understand why. These innovative new services embody the changing competitive landscape that consumers enjoy today. We no longer live in a world where wireline simply competes with wireline or where mobile just competes with mobile. 
Increasingly, we're seeing cable providers serve mobile wireless customers, while traditional mobile wireless carriers add customers to their in-home broadband services. The silos are fading away, and, con and consumers are reaping the rewards. The item we adopt today recognizes that consumers don't care whether the signal was beamed to their device from a tower on top of an office building or from a satellite orbiting the Earth. They only care that they have access to an affordable, high-quality connection. Space mobile services, like those envisioned by this item, will help extend coverage even further across the country to keep consumers connected across rural and remote areas. Today's item also helps us take another step towards extending America's space leadership. And that's good for our economy and national security as well. Indeed, space, as they say, is the ultimate high ground. And space leadership has long been a priority for the US. However, with the space economy growing at an accelerating clip, thanks to new investments from public and private sectors around the world, we must redouble our efforts to ensure that America stays in the driver's seat. So I've been pleased with the Commission's work in recent years towards getting our policies right in this regard. With this new proceeding, we also need to keep walking and chewing gum at the same time. And that means we need to keep our efforts up on modernizing our broader regulatory framework for satellites in a way that accelerates the processing of applications and encourages more providers to base their operations right here in the US. The Bipartisan SAT Streamlining Act, authored by the leaders of House Energy and Commerce Committee, would do just that as a good guide star for us here at the agency. So I look forward to working alongside my colleagues uh, and those in Congress to advance our shared interests in extending our global leadership in space. As we move forward in this proceeding with standing up this framework, we also need to move quickly with processing and approving the space mobile applications that are already pending at the FCC. Uh, we can't let this new proceeding slow down those ongoing reviews. In closing, I wanna thank staff from the Wireless Bureau, International Bureau as well, for their hard work on the item before us. It has my support and thanks uh, to the chair for bringing this item and these ideas forward. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. As we reach for new heights in the space economy, I'm proud that American companies are leading the way. Satellite cellular partnerships are just merely the latest example. By my count, they involve at least three established U.S. LEO operators, several U.S. satellite startups, leading U.S. handset and software companies, a U.S. chip maker, and of course, our wireless companies. That doesn't even include the U.S. satellite companies that have announced plans to deliver satellite 5G on their own or companies that have altogether not released their plans as they explore these possibilities. I'll have a longer statement for the record, but how far this capability advances truly remains to be seen, and the critical questions remain about ultimate performance. But given the clear potential here and the surge in recent activity, we are right to make sure that our rules follow suit. And that's why I do strongly support today's NPRM. It proposes a new framework for offering supplemental coverage from SCS. If adopted, I believe these rules would allow satellites to step in and provide connectivity where terrestrial coverage is unavailable using terrestrial spectrum, as if they were a seamless component of the terrestrial network itself. Building on that framework that works for every conceivable commercial arrangement and every technology is no easy feat. Risks bogging down progress as we work towards new rules. And so the NPRM smartly proposes a narrow set of initial entry criteria so that we can move full speed ahead on proposals that raise the fewest technical challenges while seeking comment on how one day we might broaden the scope. I'm glad uh, that the chair and my colleagues accepted my edits to clarify that in taking this approach, we are in no way proposing to shut the door on systems that do not meet our initial criteria here today. We've already seen signs of interest in SES from wireless carriers that do not have nationwide spectrum, from carriers that do not believe their non-nationwide non-holdings uh, offer a better fit for service. We've also seen interest in SES from satellite operators that are still experimenting or do not have a commercial license covering the full scale of their system. And we've seen smaller and regional carriers raise concerns 
about being left behind. None of these scenarios would meet the initial criteria we propose here today due to their complexity, but in a marketplace this very dynamic, we shouldn't stall innovation as parties work to meet the policy considerations that we lay out here today, especially with technologies that have the potential to improve our safety and improve bridging the digital divide. Thank you to the Commission staff for their hard work on this outstanding proposal. It has my full support. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today, we expect the Commission to adopt a proposal for a regulatory framework that allows satellite operators to offer direct handset service, or as the item newly defines it, to provide supplemental coverage from space by combining satellite and terrestrial networks to provide service in remote, unserved, and underserved areas. This item explores crucial changes to FCC rules that will ensure vital and innovative services are delivered to those who need them most. It's no secret that I'm a big fan of the satellite industry. I remain astounded by the rapid growth of the NGSO sector, which has brought new and robust competition to the broadband marketplace. NGSO has, in fact, created a seismic shift in how FCC policymakers, Congress, and others do and must assess the broadband marketplace as a whole, including how and whether to revamp the subsidy programs available to serve the very areas this service is designed to reach, and whether and how to redefine broadband service as these services come online and begin to proliferate. As uh, stated succinctly in a recent article, there's not a single regulatory framework that addresses mobile cellular devices with satellite capabilities. This unaddressed dichotomy belongs to the past, and national satellite service licensing frameworks need to be flexible enough to allow for the smartphones of the present, because satellite direct-to-handset connectivity is an industry development that is here to stay. I think that that is precisely the situation that this item proposes to resolve, to add two regulatory frameworks for a combination that um, is at least intended to flexibly address the needs of all providers in the space, for lack of a better word. The extent it doesn't do that, it seeks comment on what else the FCC should and can do to facilitate these innovative services. In that sense, this item is the beginning of the discussion about a new regulatory model, and the FCC needs industry and others to tell us how to get it right. And so I look forward to a fulsome record. That said, in the meantime, I do not want to see this proceeding get in the way of the FCC approving the waiver applications of providers who have sought permission to launch direct to handset services right now. The FCC must ensure these applicants uh, move forward at a rapid clip to avoid thwarting business plans and future innovation. I'd like to thank the staff of the Wireless and International Bureaus for this hard their hard work on this complex and groundbreaking item, and it has my support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. We are fast heading to a world where next generation wireless networks will connect everyone and everything around us. They will open up possibilities for communications that we can't even fully imagine today. But we will not be successful in this effort to make this always on connectivity available to everyone everywhere if we limit ourselves to just one technology. We're going to need it all. Fiber networks, licensed terrestrial wireless systems, next generation unlicensed technology, and satellite broadband. But if we do it right, these networks will seamlessly interact in a way that's just invisible to the user. We won't need to think about what network, where, and what services are available. Connections will just work everywhere, all the time. Now this vision is what we are calling the single network future, and the opportunities are big. But the path to this future is going to require many steps, and we take an important one today. So instead of talking in generalities about what lies ahead, let me provide a very clear example of what it means to have a single network future with coverage everywhere. So consider Angeles National Forest in California. This is a wilderness area that is somewhere between the San Gabriel Mountains and the Sierra Polona Mountains. And if that doesn't familiar, sound familiar, just know this, that is just north of Los Angeles. So this area is a welcome retreat from the hustle and bustle of one of our largest cities. Now the landscapes here are pretty amazing, but the topography makes it difficult to get a consistent wireless signal. Back in December, a couple was traveling in this area and their car went off the road. In fact, it fell 300 feet from the Angeles Forest Highway. This is a really remote area. There was no cell service. No one would have known to look for them. Plus, this is the kind of environment that, beautiful as it is, gets really treacherous at night when the temperatures drop precipitously. Now, this story could have happened in lots of places, and it could have ended for this couple right then and there, but it did not. They survived with some grit, some luck, and some new technology. 
they had a phone that had a new feature, the ability to connect directly to satellite signals delivered from space. A help message reached first responders with their precise location, and 30 minutes later, a rescue helicopter was airlifting the couple to the hospital. What is so striking about this story is that it demonstrates how bringing satellite and terrestrial wireless capabilities together can accomplish what neither network can do on its own. And we're starting to see direct satellite to smartphone communication move from sci-fi fantasy to real world prospect. Because small startups, big operators, handset providers, and even software companies have all announced new plans to connect satellites directly to our devices so that we always stay connected, and especially when the unthinkable occurs. So this is really neat. But it's important to remember for now that these early space communications projects may not provide high-speed broadband from the stratosphere to our phones. But to start, they could deliver low bandwidth connectivity suitable for emergency calls and texts in remote settings where our terrestrial networks just don't reach. For this innovation to have a chance to deliver at scale and for us to really move forward toward that single network future, we're going to need more providers and more spectrum plans and a global footprint. So regulators are going to have to develop frameworks that support its development. After all, not everyone is going to have the pieces to make all of this work. Some businesses and technology models will require new and different regulatory approvals before they can get off the ground. There are challenges with access to airwaves, frequencies that are not all globally aligned, possibilities for interference that need to be managed, and standards that could help grow all of these capabilities. But what is clear? is that with the growing interest in the possibilities of convergence of satellite and terrestrial services, an ad hoc case-by-case -case approach to these new ventures is just not enough. Last month, I spoke about this vision of a single network future at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. There was a lot of interest from regulators and companies around the globe because the framework we are proposing here is the first of its kind anywhere in the world. We are going to lead. And this is what leadership looks like. Today, we are proposing a way forward for supplemental coverage from space. This would allow a satellite operator to partner with a terrestrial mobile licensee to get access to their terrestrial spectrum through a lease arrangement and modification of the satellite operator's license. Then the satellite system can provide service directly to the subscribers of the wireless carrier in areas where the carrier lacks coverage. While our starting proposal focuses on frequency bands where the wireless licensee has nationwide service, we're not going to limit our efforts to just that scenario. So we see comment on how this could work if the mobile carrier has less than a nationwide footprint, and we can come up with ways that still protect spectrum rights and prevent harmful interference. So our approach is designed to make it easier for satellite operators collaborating with terrestrial providers to obtain authorization for converged services. By providing clear rules, I think we can kickstart more innovation in the space economy while also expanding wireless coverage in remote and unserved areas. We can make mobile dead zones a thing of the past. But even better, we have an opportunity to bring our spectrum policies into the future and move past the binary choices between mobile spectrum on the one hand and satellite spectrum on the other. That means we can reshape the airwave access debates of old and develop new ways to get more out of our spectrum resources. That's exciting, so let's get to it. And I wanna thank the many, many staff who have made this latest entry in our space innovation agenda possible. So hold on, it really is a lot of them. And that includes Steve Buzzenow, <coughs> Melissa Conway, Lloyd Coward, Peter Doronko, Tom Dinej, Kaya DeRose, Cameron Etinod, Garnett Hanley, Carrie Hicks, Joyce Jones, Alice Cothy, Lamine Cohn, Susanna Larson, John Lockwood, John Markman, Roger Noel, Jess Quinley, John Schauble, Blaise Sinto, Larry Summers, and Joel Tobinblatt and Janet Young from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Gregory Baker, Jennifer Gilson, Neshe Gundelsberger, Dante Ibarra, Carl Kensinger, Catherine Medley, Carrie Murray, Robert Nelson, Stephanie Neville, Kathy O'Brien, Jim Schlichting, Tom Sullivan, Tori Tanner, and Marissa Velez from the International Bureau. Jamie Coleman, Michael Ha, Ira Keltz, Juan Montenegro, Nick Oros, Jameson Prime, Ron Rapazzi, Dana Schaefer, Tom Struble, and Aniqua Tashin from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Doug Klein, Dave Conskell, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, 
Judith Dempsey, Lonnie Hoffman, Kate Matraves, Julia McHenry, Daniel Scheiman, Don Stockdale, and Patrick Sun from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Brenda Boykin, John Evanoff, David Firth, Shabir Hamid, Deborah Jordan, David Kirshner, Ahmed Lajui, and Erica Olson and Rasul Safavian, along with Rachel Ware and James Wiley from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Loyani Gal, Eric Ehrenreich, Kathy Harvey, Jeremy Marcus, Victoria Rendazzo, and Salman Satashi from the Enforcement Bureau, and Michael Gaslow, Joy Ragsdale, and Shauna Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. Big efforts take big teams. We will now proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item two on your agenda is titled Ensuring Just and Reasonable Rates for Incarcerated People. And we're presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and Trent Hargrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Hargrader, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a notice to propose rulemaking and order that if adopted would begin the Commission's implementation of the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act of 2022 regarding incarcerated people's communication services. I would like to thank the entire Bureau for their work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, and the Office of Communications Business Opportunities with whom we collaborated. Seated at the table with me from the Wireline Competition Bureau are from the front office, Terry Natoli, and from the Pricing Policy Division, David Zessiger, William Kehoe, Victoria Kohlberg, Goldberg, and Peter Bean. Peter Bean, an attorney advisor, will now present the item. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Nearly 20 years ago, Martha Wright Reed and her fellow petitioners first sought commission relief from the exorbitant payphone rates they had to pay to talk to their incarcerated loved ones. On January 5th, 2023, President Biden signed into law the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act of 2022 to address the problem of unreasonably high rates and charges incarcerated people and their families pay for communication services. The act requires the commission to ensure that rates and charges for incarcerated people's communication services, or IPCS, are just and reasonable, expands the definition of payphone service in correctional institutions to encompass certain advanced communication services, including any audio or video communication service, and clarifies that the commission's jurisdiction extends to intrastate as well as interstate and international IPCS. The act also directs the commission to adopt necessary regulations to implement its provisions no earlier than 18 months and no later than 24 months after the date of its enactment, allows the commission to use industry-wide average costs in setting rates and requires the commission to consider the costs of necessary safety and security measures. The notice of proposed rulemaking and order before you, if adopted, would build on the commission's reform efforts to date and begin the process of implementing the Martha Wright Reed Act. If adopted, the notice of proposed rulemaking would invite comment on how the commission should interpret and implement the Martha Wright Reed Act including seeking comment on the purpose and scope of the Act's provisions expanding the Commission's statutory authority over IPCS, the meaning of just and reasonable in the context of the Act's other provisions, and how the Act affects the Commission's ability to ensure that all IPCS and associated equipment are accessible to and usable by incarcerated people with communication disabilities. The notice would also seek comment on the rate-making approach the Commission should use to determine just and reasonable rates for IPCS, the safety and security costs necessary for IPCS, 
and how to evaluate cost differences in offering IPCS based on facility size or other characteristics as directed by the Act. The order, if adopted, would reaffirm the Commission's 2021 delegation of authority to the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Economics and Analytics to conduct a data collection. Given the statutory provisions requiring the Commission to consider certain types of data in adopting new regulations to implement the Act, the order also directs the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Office of Economics and Analytics to update and restructure the existing data collection to collect data on all incarcerated people's audio and video communication services from all providers now subject to the Commission's expanded authority under the Act. The Bureau recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Thanks. Carr. Thanks. Uh, over the last few years, I've had the chance to hear directly from the families who've experienced firsthand the difficulties of maintaining contact with their incarcerated loved ones. I've also listened to uh, formerly incarcerated individuals who underscored the decline in mental and emotional health that can result from a lack of external communications. Indeed, studies have repeatedly shown just how vital increased communications between incarcerated people and their families, friends, and other outside resources is, and that these types of connections also help reduce recidivism rates. This is no coincidence. Successful reintroduction to society largely turns on having a meaningful support network, including access to job and housing resources. A big part of enabling this increased communication is ensuring that providers are limited to charging just and reasonable rates for inmate calling services. But the marketplace for these services has long been broken. Providers face no competition and market forces don't operate to constrain the charges that they pass along to consumers. The FCC has had a critical role to play in regulating certain aspects of this marketplace and has taken other actions to address providers' abusive practices. But courts have turned aside several FCC actions that they deemed an excess of agency authority. With that string of DC Circuit decisions, the FCC has been unable to alter the status quo, despite broad consensus on the types of reforms that are necessary. For this reason, I welcome Congress's passage of the Martha Wright Reed Act, which provides the FCC with the authority to establish rules for intrastate and international prison calls, as well as for a broader range of advanced communications services. This will be increasingly important as more incarcerated individuals rely on video communication to stay in touch with their family, friends, and other important resources such as attorneys or medical professionals. As we move to implement the Martha Wright Reed Act, I'm hopeful that we'll do a top to bottom review of the costs borne today by the families of incarcerated individuals. This proceeding presents a unique opportunity to think outside the box and explore new ways of ensuring that the rates charged are just and reasonable. This includes exploring the role that site commissions play in the rates charged and whether the commission can and should do more to address those charges which can add to the cost of providing services inside correctional facilities. The Martha Wright Reed Act also requires the Commission to ensure that these advanced communications services are accessible to incarcerated individuals with disabilities, including those with hearing or speech loss. This remains an important issue for the FCC, and I hope we move expeditiously to ensure that all incarcerated individuals have equal and affordable access to equivalent communications services in prisons and jails. This item will have a meaningful impact on incarcerated individuals and their families and friends. So I want to thank the Wireline Bureau for their work on the item. And I want to thank the, the right petitioners as well for their diligent work to bring these issues to light and for their efforts over this now two decade long fight. Uh, the item has my support. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Famous words, of course, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and one fitting for today. 
More than 20 years ago, Mrs. Martha Wright Reed began her fight for affordable and fair rates for communication services for incarcerated individuals and their families. Many of you may know her story, but it is worthwhile to revisit here briefly. As a blind elderly woman, her options to stay in touch with her grandson were limited when he was moved to a correctional facility in Arizona, some 2,000 miles from her home in Washington, D.C. Without the ability to communicate via letters or in person, her only option to stay in contact with him was via a weekly phone call on Sunday after church. Calling her grandson a few times a month turned out to be a real struggle. The per minute rates were very expensive on top of the various fees that added up to hundreds of dollars a month. She was forced to decide between staying in touch with her grandson, providing him a connection to the outside world, or paying for other expenses like her medication, her groceries. Sometimes something had to give, but it was never her connection with her grandson. But here's what she realized. If she was struggling to afford paying for these calls, surely other families were as well. Over the next 23 years, what started with her personal phone bill turned into a nationwide movement dedicated to lowering the communications rates in incarceration families. When Wright Reed started her efforts, a call from Washington to an incarceration facility in California used to cost as much as $17 for 15 minutes. That same call now can be as low as three to four dollars. The commission has worked. Going back to then Commissioner Mignon Clyburn's leadership over 10 years ago to stop exorbitant charges. However, the commission was limited at the time in what it could do with regard to the rates for intrastate calls, which represent over 80% of the total calls from incarceration facilities. Following Wright Reed's passing in 2015, others picked up the mantle, the petitioners Im importantly, but including Senator Duckworth along with co-sponsors Senator Blumenthal, Booker, Casey, Coons, Gillibrand, King, Klobuchar, Luan, Markey, Portman, Schatz, Warren, and Wyden, and the, um, um, uh, also Congressman Rush. And last year, Congress passed the Martha Wright Reed Act, which for the first time gives the FCC the authority to regulate intrastate rates at incarceration facilities. By clearly extending the Commission's authority here, we can now work towards ensuring that rates charged are just and reasonable, consistent with the Commission's standard in Section 202. This is a huge step. Equally important, the Martha, Reed Act, uh, Martha Wright Reed Act uh, expands our authority to ensure that rates are just and reasonable for advanced communication uh, systems such as vid video visitation that many incarcerated persons and correctional facilities use to stay connected while also protecting security. Ensuring that rates for advanced communication services offered to incarcerated individuals are just is also long overdue and supporting incarcerated populations that are deaf and hard of hearing or face other communication disabilities is equally important. Last September, we adopted a report and order and notice of proposed rulemaking focused specifically on ensuring that incarcerated people with communications disabilities have functionally equivalent service as those without disabilities. The Martha Wright Reed Act will help to ensure the advanced communication services such as IPCTS will be charged at that just and reasonable rate and help supporting that call as well. Here's the point. Martha Wright Reed's call to action has moved our world. Millions of incarcerated individuals, their families, and our society are all beneficiaries of her powerful work. What a legacy. I look forward to the record that develops here. Applaud the Commission's fantastic staff and their efforts over many years here. Thank you to Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you to the Chairwoman for your hard work on this as well. I strongly approve. You're here. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you. Prison's not meant to be easy, but it's also not meant to be an opportunity to gouge prisoners and their families. With the unanimously adopted Martha Wright Reed Act, Congress has now given the FCC the authority 
to take decisive action to stamp out abuses in this sector. I'm happy to support this first step in implementing this law. Thanks very much to the FCC staff for their hard work on this complex item. Thank you, Commissioners. As we've heard, it was 20 years ago, a grandmother named Martha filed a petition calling on the Federal Communications Commission to do something about the unconscionably high phone rates charged to incarcerated people and their loved ones. You see, she just wanted to stay in touch with her grandson who was in prison. She wanted to make sure he heard what was happening at home and in her church and that he kept in contact with his young nephews. Justice delayed can be justice denied, and it took this agency far too long to pick up that petition. It took us longer still to act on it and try to address the outrageous charges families of the incarcerated pay for phone service. When we did, we made headway. We cut rates for calls. We limited ancillary service fees. We put restrictions on site commissions. But our work was not always embraced by the courts. We were told over and over again that we did not have the authority to address every aspect of these rates because while interstate calls fell within our jurisdiction, intrastate calls did not. This limited our ability to provide families relief and meaningfully address that petition that was filed here so long ago. But no more. At the start of this year, President Biden signed into law the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act. It is a piece of legislation that honors the trailblazing work of a grandmother who knew something was wrong and set out to make it right. In the United States, we are home to the largest incarcerated population in the world. No other country even comes close. We spend so much to keep our criminal justice system in place. But that understates the real cost, swelling despair, destroyed potential, and diminished possibilities for rehabilitation. And phone calls, as simple as they are, are so important because those in prison are often separated from their families by hundreds of miles. And families may lack the time and means to make regular visits. Phone calls are the only way to stay connected. But when the price of a single phone call can be as much as what most of us spend for a monthly unlimited plan, it can be hard to stay in touch. And that's not just a strain on the household budget. It harms all of us because regular contact with kin can reduce recidivism. So we are now due for some speed. We are going to use this new law and the expanded authority it provides to ensure that the rates for prison phone calls, both interstate and intrastate, are just and reasonable. We are going to use it to address advanced communication services like video. And we are going to use it to ensure access to these communications as possible by those with disabilities. Along the way, we will work to integrate these new efforts with what we have done before so that across the board, these policies are both fair and sustainable. Like I said, we are going to move fast because the Martha Wright Reed Just and Reasonable Communications Act demands we produce results between 18 and 24 months after enactment, and too many have waited too long for us to address these usurious rates. Martha Wright Reed passed away eight years ago but we would not be here today without her. We also wouldn't be here without the work of my friend and former colleague, Mignon Clyburn, who was the one to tell this agency to pick up that petition. Her conscience informs this proceeding and everything in this new law. Thank you also to congressional leaders who worked for years on this new law, putting a more just system within reach, especially Senator Tammy Duckworth and former Congressman Bobby Rush, as well as the many co-sponsors in both the House and Senate of this legislation. Thank you also to the advocates who supported this effort and the work of this agency. We would not be here without you. And in addition to these leaders, I want to thank Commission staff for their continued efforts for this work, including Susan Barr, Ahava Bottoms, Peter Bean, Callie Coker, Victoria Goldberg, Amy Goodman, Trent Harkrader, William Kehoe, Lee McFarland, Stephen Neal, Terry Natoli, Simon Soleimani, Haley Stephan Gil Strobel, Jennifer Best Vickers, and David Zeisiger from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Robert Ulrich, Diane Burstein, Daryl Cooper, Aaron Garza, Elliot Greenwald, Alejandro Roark, 
and Michael Scott from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Connor Altman, Amanda Batag, Paula Sech, Zania Gonzalez, Eugene Kisilev, Richard Kwiatkowski, Julia McHenry, Eric Ralph, Michelle Schlafer, and Jeff Waldo from the Office of Economics and Analytics, Sarah Citrin, Michelle Ellison, Valerie Hill, Marcus Mayer, Richard Mallon, Joel Rabinowitz, William Richardson, and Shin Yu from the Office of General Counsel, Jim Balliger and Brian Moulton from the Office of Legislative Affairs, Ann Weigel and Will Wilquist from the Office of Media Relations, and Kara Grayer, Michael Gasso, and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. All right, at long last, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges <coughs> as requested. Madam Secretary, can you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Call Authentication Trust Anchor and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. And once again, Trent Hargreider, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Hargreider, please proceed again. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners again. The Wireline Competition Bureau is again pleased to present for your consideration a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that, if adopted, would take important steps to combat illegal robocalls. This item would strengthen the Commission's caller ID authentication obligations, expand robocall mitigation rules for all providers, adopt more robust enforcement tools, define the authentication obligations of satellite providers, and seek comment on additional steps to further enhance the effectiveness of the stir shaken caller ID authentication framework. I'd like to thank the Bureau team for their hard work as well as our colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, the International Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, the Office of Economics and Analytics, and the Office of General Counsel, of course, for their review and input. Joining me at the table is the small but mighty team of Competition Policy Division Assistant Division Chief Zach Ross and Mary Wolf, who's an attorney advisor. Mary will take it away. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Commission continues to receive more complaints about unwanted calls, including illegal robocalls, than any other issue. As a result, this agency must remain vigilant and track technological changes that could cause consumers to lose faith in the communication systems and networks on which they rely. The caller ID authentication framework, known as Stirshaken, is a key component of the Commission's multifaceted approach to protecting consumers from the consequences of these unwanted and illegal calls. This technology allows providers to verify that the caller ID information transmitted with the call matches the caller's number, and to use that information to protect their subscribers from illegally spoofed calls. The Commission's rules currently require most types of voice service providers to implement stir shaken in the IP portions of their networks. But there's presently no mandatory requirement in the Commission's rules for intermediate providers, providers that neither originate nor terminate a call to do so. As a result, a call that has not been authenticated by an originating provider may traverse the call path without stir shaken authentication. If adopted, the sixth caller ID authentication report in order would close that gap by requiring the first intermediate provider in the call chain to use stir shaken to authenticate any unauthenticated session initiation protocol calls they receive from originating providers by December 31st, 2023, subject to any applicable extension. The expansion of the stir shaken framework will maximize the number of calls that are authenticated and facilitate traceback efforts, call blocking, and analytics that are essential to protecting consumers from illegally spoofed robocalls. Next, if adopted, the sixth report in order would expand the Commission's robocall mitigation requirements by requiring all providers, including those that have fully implemented stir shaken or that may be subject to implementation extensions, to take reasonable steps to mitigate illegal robocall traffic and to submit a certification and robocall mitigation plan to the robocall mitigation database. 
In addition, the sixth report and order would require all providers to submit additional information with their robocall mitigation database certifications, including but not limited to details regarding their role or roles in the call chain, any applicable stir shaken implementation extensions, and whether the provider has been the subject of a formal commission, law enforcement, or regulatory action with accompanying findings of actual or suspected wrongdoing concerning the transmission, encouragement, or facilitation of illegal robocalls and spoofing. It would also prohibit downstream providers from accepting traffic from intermediate providers that are not listed in the robocall mitigation database. The sixth report in order would also enhance the commission's robocall enforcement tools by adopting a per call maximum forfeiture for violations of the robocall blocking rules, subjecting intermediate providers to removal from the robocall mitigation database for deficient certifications, and establishing an expedited process for removing providers from that submit facially deficient certifications. The sixth report in order would also establish consequences for repeat offenders of the robocall mitigation rules by reinforcing the commission's authority to revoke section 214 operating authority or other types of commission authorizations or certifications of entities engaging in continued violations of the robocall mitigation rules and making clear that the commission will consider repeat violations of the robocall mitigation rules and future review of applications for commission authorizations, licenses, and certifications. Lastly, the sixth report in order, if adopted, would grant an ongoing stir shaken implementation extension on the basis of undue hardship for service providers that are satellite service providers that are small service providers using North American numbering plan numbers to originate calls and direct the Wireline Competition Bureau to refer issues regarding the treatment of international roaming traffic under our call authentication rules to the North American Numbering Council for further investigation. The sixth further notice of proposed rulemaking, if adopted, would seek comments on additional measures to strengthen the Commission's caller ID authentication regime and stem the tide of illegally spoofed robocalls. Specifically, it would seek more focused comment on the use of third-party caller ID authentication solutions, including whether the Commission should be, make any changes to the rules to permit, prohibit, or limit their use. It would also seek comment on whether to eliminate the stir shaken implementation extension for providers that cannot obtain service provider code tokens, which are necessary to participate in the stir shaken caller ID authentication framework. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. It gets technical awfully <laughs> fast. <laughs> All right, we'll hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, for summary and for the team for the, the work on this. Any reasonable step to crack down on a robocall is a step that I support. Uh, this item obviously has a lot of them. I, I hope and look forward to a day, hopefully in the, the not too distant future, when I can uh, look at my cell phone uh, and actually answer it when it's a number that's not already in my contact list. I don't know that we're quite there yet, uh, but we're working towards that day, and I look, I look forward to it. So thanks to the team for the, the hard work on this. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Our meetings, conversations, even meals can continue to be interrupted by robocalls. It's even been known to interrupt an open meeting. <laughs> they remain the Commission's number one source of complaints, something we've been working on hard to stem, adopting five reports and orders on stir shaken so far. There's good news as we adopt the sixth report and order today. The Commission's effort to deter robocalls and authenticate caller ID are making a difference. According to a recent release from the FTC, it received 1.8 million complaints about robocalls in 2022, but that number is down from 3.4 million complaints in 2021. And so that is real progress. We are, uh, there is more work still to be done. Stir Shaken works best by improving both transparency and accountability among providers and consumers. So today we strengthen both. 
strengthen the transparency of our stir shaken regime, regime by closing one of the loopholes that allowed unauthenticated calls into the path and separately we improve accountability as well as transparency by strengthening the robocall mitigation database. But I think the most important part of today's item, certainly one that I like best, is strengthening our enforcement authorities. We ensure that providers follow our robocall blocking rules by setting a strong max forfeiture for each call failed to be blocked. And we adopt rules to remove non-gateway intermediate providers from the database for violating our rules and establish an expedited process to remove providers from the database for facially deficient certifications. I'll have a longer statement for the record, but ultimately, we are making progress, blunting the growth of robocalls. I'm confident that with the new requirements we vote on here today, that trend will continue. Thank you to the staff for their hard work on this item. Thank you, Commissioner Symington. Thank you. As the chairwoman just said, it gets technical fast. <laughs> if prohibiting illegal robocalls was easy, we would have done it long ago, which is why I so much appreciate the commission staff's work in unpicking the Gordian knot of allowing international software telephony while protecting the integrity of consumer expectations that calls will be legitimate and wanted. That's what makes it a pleasure to support this item. Stopping illegal, illegal robocalls is one of the most important jobs tasked to the commission and, as has been widely noted, one of our greatest sources of complaints. Many Americans have fallen prey to the scams carried out through these calls. Even more have lost faith in the telephone system and no longer respond to numbers that they don't recognize, such as my colleague, Commissioner Carr. <laughs> and just about every single person in this country has been thoroughly annoyed by this outrageous criminal activity, even if they haven't suffered a greater injury than that. So thank you to Commission staff for your tireless work on not just this item, but the thorny, complex, ongoing issue. Thank you, Commissioner Symington. Gordian Knot, very true. The scammers behind robocalls are relentless. They are always looking for loopholes and new ways to advance old schemes. But today we shut down a gap we found in our policies demonstrating that we can be even more nimble than the bad actors responsible for these junk calls. In this order, we require the first intermediate providers in a calling path to use call authentication technology. So what does that mean? For some time, We've required carriers that originate and terminate calls to use technology like Stir Shaken to prove that a caller truly is who they say they are and not a scammer using the network to further some fraud. But the intermediate providers who may help carry a call from one carrier to another never really had the same consistent obligation to use call authentication technology. This was a gap in our rules a way to let junk calls sneak into our networks and reach unassuming consumers, but no more. Today we close this loophole and require intermediate providers that are the first to pick up a call from an originating carrier to use Stir Shaken. We also insist that they, along with all other providers, register in our robocall mitigation database. Then we go one step further and prohibit downstream carriers from accepting calls from intermediate providers not listed in the database. Finally, we ask questions in a rulemaking to further explore how third-party caller ID authentication can help build on this framework and stop further unauthorized traffic. So thank you to the robocall response team for this effort. Thank you also to our enforcement bureau because they've already demonstrated the power of this database. In fact, last year, they used it to kick seven voice providers off of our networks for sending junk calls. Now that it will be even more comprehensive, we are going to have more tools to go after those behind these scams. And thank you also to the attorneys general we have partnered with in a memorandum of understanding to crack down on illegal robocalls. We are up to 44 state attorneys general nationwide. To the six who are remaining, you will be hearing from us, and I promise you we can be relentless too. Thank you to the staff responsible for this order and rulemaking, including Allison Baker, Eric Beeth, Callie Coker, Elizabeth Dragula, CJ Ferraro, Trent Harkrader, Jonathan Lecter, Jody May, Zach Ross, and Mary Wolf from the Wireline Competition Bureau, Kenneth Carlberg, David Firth, and Deborah Jordan from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Jerusha Burnett, Aaron Garza, Alejandro Rohr, Karen Schroeder, Mark Stone, Christy Thornton, and Kimberly Wild from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Loyan Egal, Daniel Stepanovich, 
Christy Thompson and Lisa Zana from the Enforcement Bureau, Denise Coca, Kimberly Cook, Jim Schlichting, and Thomas Sullivan from the International Bureau, Michelle Ellison, Valerie Hill, Richard Mallon, William Richardson, and Derek Yeo from the Office of General Counsel, Eugene Kisilev, Julia McHenry, Virginia Matalo, Mark Montano, Michelle Schaefer, and Emily Taliga from the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Kara Grayer and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that, we will have a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, can you please announce the next item on today's agenda? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item four on your agenda is titled Targeting and Eliminating Unlawful Text Messages, Rules and Regulations Implementing the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. And it will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And Alejandra Rourke, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Rourke, good to see you. Please proceed. Uh, good to see you and good morning, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today I'm pleased to introduce on behalf of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau an item that if adopted um, would be an important step to combat unwanted and illegal text messages. Building on the work um, that wireless providers have begun, the report and order before you would establish a baseline of protection for all wireless consumers by requiring providers to block certain text messages that are highly likely to be illegal. This means that wireless customers of each provider will, for the first time, have commission required baseline protection from certain text message um, that begins to address the rising number of complaints and consumer harm that have resulted from these illegal texts. The accompanying further notice of proposed rulemaking uh, additionally proposes a set of protections that could further stem the tide of illegal and unwanted messages to American consumers. Before turning the presentation over to the Bureau of staff, I'd like to thank the Enforcement, Wireline, Public Safety and Homeland Security and Wireless Telecommunications Bureaus um, and the Offices of Communications, Business Opportunities, Economics and Analytics and General Counsel for their valuable assistance. Today I am joined um, by Christy Thornton, Acting Chief of the uh, Consumer Policy Division, and Mika Sevier, Attorney Advisor, who will present the item. Thanks. Thank you, Alejandro. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. As text messaging's popularity has grown over the past few years, so has the number of scam and annoying texts consumers receive. Since 2015, the Commission has seen more than a 500% increase in unwanted text complaints, from approximately 3,300 in 2015 to 18,900 in 2022. By one estimate, text message scams cost consumers $231 million in the first three quarters of 2022. And while robotexts do not yet affect consumers in the numbers robocalls do, in several ways, they represent greater harm. Unlike calls, texts can include links to phishing websites that appear identical to the website of a legitimate company and can load malware onto an unsuspecting consumer's device. Wireless providers and others have taken significant steps to protect consumers from illegal texts. Yet the complaint trends and unique harms texts present signal that the time is right for the commission to join the effort by ensuring all wireless consumers have a baseline of protection. The item before you takes a targeted, incremental approach by focusing on the Robotex most likely to be illegal. This approach parallels the Commission's successful work for robocall blocking by requiring mobile wireless providers to block text messages at the network level without requiring consumer opt-in or opt-out when the texts purport to be from a number on a reasonable do not originate or DNO list. That includes numbers that purport to be invalid, unallocated, or unused North American numbering plan numbers, and numbers for which the subscriber to that number has requested that texts purporting to originate from that number be blocked. Messages from these numbers are highly likely to be illegal, and no reasonable consumer would wish to receive them. The item before you also recognizes that while the blocking requirement is unlikely to result in blocking texts consumers want to receive, legitimate texters should have a means to correct erroneous blocking, as they do with call blocking. The item would thus require blockers of text messages to establish a point of contact for texters to resolve such concerns and ensure consumers receive the message they welcome. 
the accompanying further notice of proposed rulemaking would seek comment on four additional protections for consumers against illegal and unwanted text messaging. First, the further notice would seek comment on whether to require mobile wireless providers to block text messages from a sender after the provider is on notice from the commission that the sender is sending illegal texts. Where texts are clearly illegal and the commission has put mobile wireless providers on notice of illegal texts, there may be no legitimate reason for providers to transmit these texts. This proposal is similar to a recently adopted call blocking requirement. Second, the further notice would seek comment on whether and how the commission can encourage efforts to develop technical solutions for text message authentication, which could give consumers greater confidence on the sender information that accompanies a text message. Third, the further notice would ask whether the commission should clarify and codify in its rules that the national do not call registry protections include text messages, not just voice calls. The national do not call registry protects over 246 million telephone numbers from telephone solicitations. If adopted, that proposal would further protect wireless phone subscribers by requiring prior express invitation or permission in writing for text to numbers on the DNC registry. And finally, the notice would further would propose to close the lead generator loophole by prohibiting robotexters and robocallers from using a single consumer consent for messages from hundreds of telemarketers, often on subjects beyond the scope of the original consent. For example, a website that purports to enable consumers to comparison shop for insurance may seek bulk consumer consent for robotext and robocalls from companies that do not sell insurance. These so-called lead generator websites can result in consumers getting a barrage of unwanted robotext and robocalls. The further notice proposes to end that practice by requiring that a caller or texter's consent is valid only for the messages logically and topically associated with the website. We recommend adoption of this report in order and further notice of proposed rulemaking and we request editorial deliberations. Thank you. Now for comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks so much to the team for your work on this as we've been working to crack down on those illegal uh, robocalls that we're all familiar with. We also have to make sure we have the tools available uh, that allow the targeting of illegal text messages as well. Obviously, those can pose significant harms to consumers. Uh, I'm really pleased that we take those types of actions today to target those illegal text messages. We do so in a way that's consistent with the TCPA and the Truth and Caller ID Act. We make sure we don't sweep in uh, the legal text messages that consumers may want. So I think we take the right uh, targeted action here, and it has my support. So thanks again to the, the team for your work on it. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. Texting is increasingly becoming Americans' preferred way to communicate. But unfortunately, as we've seen before, more po the more popular communication services, the more it can be targeted by spammers and bad actors. The rise of robotechs, unwanted or illegal text messages, means a similar rise in potential harm to consumers in the form of phishing attacks, malware, and scams. And robotechs, I, I appreciated what you were um, saying uh, as well. Robotechs are different from robocalls, and one additional thing that, not to defend robocalls, of course, but you have the ability to pick up the phone or not when you have a robocall, but on most devices, recipients of a robotech see at least some of the unwanted message potentially exposing them or luring them into the harm. And you know, as well as I do, that getting more of these every day. In 2022, Americans received 225 billion robotechs, 157% year-over-year increase. Last month, February 2023, 10.7 billion spam texts were reported. Given this growth, it is imperative that we here at the Commission act. Building on our experience combating Roma calls and today moving to protect consumers from the threat of illegal or harmful robotechs, industry has taken impressive steps on its own, but more needs to be done. At the same time, uh, we are eager to require providers to adopt a point of contact for texters to report erroneously blocked messages to balance the needs of industry and consumers. And finally, we recognize that this is not just the first step and seek additional comments today on further proposals to protect consumers. I plan to stay vigilant in pushing the commission to do all it can to eliminate 
these illegal and unwanted text messages, especially where we've seen the expansion of texting, uh, to NG911, potentially, and 988. Uh, and it's just that important. So thank you to the hard work by the commission staff. Thank you to the chair for continuing to lead on our work here. I approve. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Today, the commission takes an important step in guarding the American people against illegal robotexts. Consumer safety is job one of the commission, and today we lay out tough but fair rules in furtherance of that mission. My thanks to bureau staff and my commission colleagues for, uh, for their hard work on this item. Thank you, commissioners. More than a century ago, physiologist Ivan Pavlov did a series of experiments with food, buzzers, and dogs. He was able to train the dogs to associate a buzzing noise with food, so much so that they began to drool whenever they heard this sound, even if there was no food around. Sometimes I wonder what Pavlov would think about us and our smartphones. <laughs> Because most of us are conditioned to reach for our phones anytime we hear that familiar buzz telling us that a text is incoming. In our defense, those noises have become an effective way to stay connected. They help us keep up with family and friends and receive timely information from those we trust. But there are those who want to take advantage of this trust and our instinct, like the subject of Pavlov's experiment, to assume something needs attention every time we hear those devices buzz. We see this clearly in the growing number of junk texts showing up in our phones. Scam artists have found that sending us messages about a package you never ordered or a payment that never went through, along with a link to a shady website, is a quick and easy way to get us to engage on our devices and have us fall prey to fraud. These Robotechs are making a mess of our phones. They are reducing trust in what is such a powerful way to communicate. So today, we take our first step to stop those unwanted texts at the network level. We put in place rules that require mobile wireless carriers to block texts that come from invalid, unallocated, or unused numbers. In other words, we require providers to stop the texts that are most likely to be illegal. This approach has the support of attorneys general from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. It's good stuff. But we're not gonna stop there because we are also adopting a rulemaking to explore other ways to stop unwanted text messages, including authentication measures and rules to prevent the abuse of consumer consent. Thank you to those at the agency who worked on this effort, including Mika Savin, Kim Wilde, James Brown, Zach Champ, Christy Thornton, Aaron Garza, Mark Stone, and Jerusha Barnett from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. We also have Rakesh Patel, Lisa Zena, Daniel Stepanisic, Christy Thompson, Kate Barbas, Jessica Manuel, and Alexandra Hobbs from the Enforcement Bureau, Susanna Larsing, Garnet Hanley, Carrie Hicks, and Jennifer Salhas from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Elizabeth Dragula, Jonathan Lecter, and Connor Ferrazzo from the Wireline Competition Bureau. Kenneth Carlberg and David Firth from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Jocelyn James, Cara Greer, and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Emily Talaga, Kim Makich, Mark Montano, Michelle Schaefer, Patrick Brogan from the Office of Economics Analytics, and Derek Yeo, Bill Richardson, Rick Mallon, and Valerie Hill from the Office of General Counsel. And Mika, you have the honor of being the first one to talk about Robotext's uh, prevention from junk at a commission meeting, so thank you. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item five on your agenda is titled Audio Description DMA Expansion and will, and will be presented by the Media Bureau and Holly Sauer, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Sauer, please proceed. Good morning. Morning? It's still morning? It, just barely. Okay. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today we present a further notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to expand the audio description regulations by phasing them in for all remaining markets. The proposal would expand the Commission's support for individuals who are blind or visually impaired 
by ensuring that they can be connected, informed, and entertained by <clears throat> television programming nationwide. Joining me at the table are Hillary DeNegro from the front office, and Maria Malarkey and Diana Sokolow from the policy division. Diana will present the item. Chairwoman and commissioners, I am pleased to present this further notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to continue expanding the audio description rules to 10 additional designated market areas each year until all designated market areas are covered. Audio description utilizes the secondary audio stream to make video programming more accessible to individuals who are blind or visually impaired by inserting narrated descriptions of a television program's key visual elements during natural pauses in the dialogue. The Commission's audio description rules apply to commercial television broadcast stations that are affiliated with one of the top four commercial television broadcast networks and are located in certain television markets. In 2011, the Commission adopted an order requiring audio description in the largest 60 markets. The 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010, or CVAA, permits the Commission to phase in the audio description regulations for an additional 10 markets per year if it determines that the costs for program owners, providers, and distributors in those additional markets are reasonable. In 2020, the Commission made such a determination when it expanded the audio description requirements to markets 61 through 100. The phased schedule for the expansion will conclude with markets 91 through 100 on January 1st, 2024. In its 2020 order, the Commission committed to examining in 2023 whether to continue expanding the audio description requirements to an additional 10 markets per year. This further notice will commence the process for making such an examination. The further notice seeks comment on the benefits of expanding the audio description requirements to markets 101 through 210, as well as the costs. The further notice proposes that if the commission determines that the costs are reasonable, the phase-in should continue with markets 101 through 110 on January 1st, 2025, and it should conclude with markets 201 through 210 on January 1st, 2035, consistent with the expansion permitted by the CVAA. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the further notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges to make any necessary technical and conf or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Thanks to the team for all the hard work on the item. It has my support. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm proud that today we make a long-term commitment to bringing the benefit of audio description to all Americans who are blind or visually impaired wherever they may live. This technology makes video accessible by inserting narrative descriptions of key visual elements into television programming. We've seen and reported to Congress, in fact, on audio descriptions benefits in the largest markets. And so today, consistent with our prior actions as contemplated by, as we heard, the CVAA, we propose to bring those benefits to all 210 DMAs, the entire country on a phased approach. To put it another way, we propose to make the service of audio description universal. So thank you to the hard work of the team. Uh, it has my strong support. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, I'd like to thank the Media Bureau for their hard work on this item. No further comments. Thank you, Commissioners. So many shows, so little time. That is what it feels like for most of us when we turn on a television today. But if you are one of the millions of people in this country with vision loss, what you can watch depends on the availability of audio description. As we've heard, this is a technology that inserts narrated descriptions of key visual elements of a television programming during some of the natural pauses in dialogue. So it helps those who are blind or visually impaired follow along so they don't miss facial expressions, physical gags, or crucial scene changes. It was more than a decade ago that Congress made audio description generally available when it passed the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. It's a law I know well because I worked on it as counsel to the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. When it was passed, it required the commission to make audio description available on programming in the largest 60 television markets around the country. 
A little over two years ago, the Commission expanded this requirement to roll it out to the largest 100 television markets. Today, we propose to finish the job by reaching all 210 markets in the United States. In other words, we want to deliver to everyone everywhere on the promise of this law, so let's get to it. After all, there's a lot of programming out there to watch. Thank you to the staff who worked on this effort, including Hilary DeNegro, Maria Malarkey, and Diana Sokolow from the Media Bureau, Diane Burstein, Will Shell, Susie Rosen Singleton, and Ross Slutsky from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and Susan Aaron, Dave Conskell, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel. And with that, we will have a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. The chair votes aye. Ooh, we're going to go to Commissioner Symington. I'm sorry. I also approve. It's lunchtime. You know, it's happening. All right. Commissioner Symington. Uh, I also approve, thanks. Twice, in fact, all right. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. All right, would any of my colleagues like to make any, any announcements at this time? We'll start with Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starks. Commissioner Symington. Um, I, I do have one, I'll keep it brief. Um, I'm pleased to say that my office's intern, uh, Kevin Howick-Horst, is here today from Indiana. Kevin's been with us since the fall and has contributed seminal analytical work regarding orbital debris issues, mapping, and radio, among other things. This comes to him easier than to me because he'll be dis defending his dissertation in economics in a few months. So thanks very much, Kevin. I'm glad you came. All right. Well, Commissioner Simington, I admire your brevity because I'm not going to be able to deliver that today. I got a bunch of announcements. Uh, first, it's with sadness I want to acknowledge the sudden passing of our FCC colleague, John Kiefer. John spent the last 21 years as an electronics engineer in the Media Bureau, where he was a technical expert on cable broadband and so many MVPD technologies. He was a proud veteran, having served as a flight officer in the United States Navy. In addition to relying on John's expertise, we really just benefited from his kindness and sense of humor. He was a friend to many, and he's going to be missed. Our condolences to his wife, Megan, and their two sons. I have an retirement announcement. As many of you might know, our colleague Tony McGowan is set to retire soon. Tony has been a valuable member of the FCC team for the past 25 years, serving the last eight years in a really important role, and that's as our agency's records officer. Throughout her tenure, she has been instrumental in all sorts of parts of the FCC's mission, and her work in recent years has been really critical because she's ensured the Commission's records are maintained with the utmost accuracy, transparency, and accountability. Her expertise in records management is really unmatched, and her commitment to public service during her whole tenure here has been unwavering. So we express our gratitude for her service, and we wish her all the best in retirement and the next chapter. We also have a retirement coming with Christina Clearwater, who is the Associate Division Chief in the Competition and Infrastructure Policy Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. She is retiring after 26 years at the FCC, and that includes time in not just the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, but also the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Christina is known throughout the agency for her positive attitude, her willingness to chip in whenever needed, and most importantly, for her dedication for a quarter of a century to public service. We wish Christina the best as she begins the next chapter in her life. We also have a retirement with John Husney, you see, with Joe Husney. Joe is one of those people here who has really seen it all. He is going to be a tough act to follow. He joined the FCC in 1983 as an electronics engineer in the former Office of Science and Technology. And while he was there, he worked on reviewing equipment authorization applications and testing equipment for RF interference. In fact, he even co-authored what we know as Me Measurement Procedure 4, which we're still using today. In 1990, he went to the Media Bureau to supervise television engineering staff, and then he transitioned to what was the Field Operations Bureau, where he served as an engineer in charge of our Norfolk Field Office and at the FCC's former National Engineering Training Center. Okay, also something not widely known is he has been an important part of the FCC team leading emergency support function two activities. And what that means is he has been absolutely essential to the work of this agency to help support the restoration of communications in the aftermath of disaster. Just for example, he deployed for the agency to Louisiana for an extended time after Hurricane Katrina, and he also helped on behalf of the United States 
in Haiti following the 2010 earthquake. Now, in more recent times, he found his home in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and he served as the interagency liaison to Federal Spectrum Deconfliction Committee, which is a big name for actually a big job, because he coordinated with the Secret Service to help perform national security and public safety operations in support of events like, I don't know, the presidential inauguration, the State of the Union address, nominating conventions, and multiple Super Bowls, as well as meetings of the UN General Assembly. So he has contributed immeasurably to this agency and his, this country during his tenure at the FCC. We have a lot of respect and admiration for his service, and again, we wish him only good things as he heads off into retirement. Now finally, I want to acknowledge folks who are not leaving. We have got the Employee of the Year Award. So I'm pleased right now to recognize Scott Novick and Sue Sterner as the recipients of the 2021 to 2022 Employee of the Year Award, which is an award that is jointly presented by the FCC and NTEU Chapter 209 for our bargaining unit employees. After considering nomination information from our peers, supervisors, and managers, a joint union and management committee recommended Scott and Sue as Employee of the Year for which they're going to share a $10,000 reward and get a plaque in recognition of their achievements. And they're really ones that will have a lasting impact on the FCC, so let me explain them. Scott is an appellate attorney in the Office of General Counsel, and he was recognized for his exceptional work successfully defending the FCC actions to revoke authorizations of China Telecom to provide communication services in the United States and make available spectrum for Wi-Fi and other unlicensed use. These are matters that involved unbelievably complex and sensitive national security and technology safety issues, and they impacted multiple federal agencies along with the public at large. We really thank him for his work. Sue Sterner is an auctions marketing specialist in the Office of Economics and Analytics, and she was recognized for her contributions to four different auctions. Those would be auctions 108, 109, 110, and 112, particularly for her work testing and ensuring all of our auction systems ran smoothly in different environments during a pandemic, including through a whole bunch of new VDI solutions, on-site work, and high-security virtual private networks. This stuff works seamlessly because of people like her. She was also instrumental in the successful modernization of systems that supported the auction in our Gettysburg field office with bitter phone lines, making sure that Spectrum licenses were disseminated to the wide variety of licensees as required under the Communications Act. So congratulations to both Scott and Sue on this very well-deserved honor. Thank you. And kudos to them for their terrific service to the American people. Madam Secretary, will you announce the next date for the Commission's monthly meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, April 20th, 2023. Until then, we stand adjourned. Good morning, everyone. If we could please have outside conversations take place in the hallway, we're going to get started with the chairwoman's press conference momentarily. Any outside conversations, if you could please remove them to outside of the commission room, we'd greatly appreciate it. And with that, I am Paloma Perez. I am the press secretary for the Federal Communications Commission. And I'd like to welcome Chairwoman Rosenworcel to the stage um, for our regular press conference. Chairwoman. Thank you, Paloma. Thank you so many of you for being here today. We had a busy agenda. All right, let's get started. Matt. Madam Chairwoman, thanks. Uh, Matt Daneman, Communications Daily. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to warm in two questions. First off, can you discuss or uh, talk about how the SEC's authority, uh, authority's exp uh, expiration is impacting operations? And secondly, any reaction to the ALJ uh, denying the standard Tegna motion to certify? Thanks. Uh, 
With respect to the second question, you know that it is presently before the administrative law judge, so you can read that decision and also read our hearing designation order, but I can't talk about it further at this time. Uh, with respect to the expiration of Spectrum Auction Authority, it's not good. For three decades, the FCC has had the authority to auction off our airwaves. We've held more than 100 auctions. We've raised more than $233 billion. We have delivered tremendous value for the American people. As a result of having that authority, the United States has been able to lead the world when it comes to wireless. The expiration of that authority is not just unfortunate, I think it puts at risk our leadership. I think our national and economic security depends on us having a steady pipeline of spectrum for commercial markets, and I don't want to cede that leadership to any other country out there. Well, first things first, what we're proposing with the single network future is a rulemaking. And we have modeled off the availability of certain kinds of licenses being available nationwide. But we've made adjustments to ask questions to try to accommodate all sorts of different circumstances. What's becoming increasingly apparent is when you look at supplemental coverage from space, there are a lot of different technical and economic models that are emerging. We have small startups, big operators, software companies, handset providers, all interested in exploring this marketplace. And we wanted to make sure that our rulemaking has some clear ideas about how to move forward, but also questions about other models that we are not able to really identify the pathway forward for today, but are really interested in making happen. I believe we made an adjustment to add some questions about FirstNet, but I'm gonna ask you to follow up with the Bureau on that. And uh, this was just subject of discussion, I know, when we had back and forth from the ori original draft. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, wanted to circle back on robocalls. Um, I think you've asked Congress for additional statutory authority in this area. Could you kind of uh, explain where that stands and uh, any, any further thoughts on that, especially seeking fines directly in court? I believe you're referring to a letter that I wrote to Senator Lujan, who I saw yesterday to talk a little more about this and other issues. I, scam artists are always looking for a new way, and our robocall policies need to be updated at this commission, and the laws that give us authority need to be updated too. There are three things that I think the FCC would benefit from going forward with respect to robocalls. The first is we need to expand the definition of autodialer. There was a Supreme Court decision a year and a half ago that narrowed the definition of autodialer. It makes it a lot harder to go after bad actors who are flooding our phone lines with these calls. That's perverse. We've got to fix that Supreme Court decision. Second, I want to make sure that we get a little more financial information, like there maybe have some adjustments under the Bank Secrecy Act to further understand some of these bad actors and how they move from one company to the next. I think this will help us trace who's responsible for these calls more effectively and more efficiently. And third, one of the consequences of the FCC being able to use the Telephone Consumer Protection Act to, uh, to take to task bad actors who are sending robocalls our way is that we can announce fines, but we have to rely on our colleagues at the Department of Justice to go enforce them in court. I would very much like to be able to have this agency go prosecute those fines. I want to make it a priority. I want to make sure we go after everyone who's been fined every way we can. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you, Chairwoman. And with that, I'll call up my colleague, Katie Gorsak, who will be running the Bureau press conference. All right, thank you, Paloma. And we'll start our Bureau press conference where we'll take questions on today's meeting items, and we're gonna go in the order that they were uh, 
announced. So we'll start with today's IB item on uh, regulatory framework for supplemental space coverage. Questions? All right, IB. Matt Daneman, Communications Daily. Uh, Commissioner Starks talked about edits uh, made to the, the draft item to make clear that uh, the FCC is thinking about spectrum footprints that aren't necessarily national. Can you, can you elaborate on, on those edits and any other changes from the, the draft item, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think what Commissioner Starks was alluding to is that there was some additional language put into the item that um, makes clear that the FCC, in addition to the frameworks that are proposed in the rulemaking, is not only asking questions about a variety of other models, but also um, will be open to consider other requests that may come in, for example, a request for waivers and the like um, along the way. Um, so the, the proposal in the item is, is focused on having a large contiguous area of spectrum, but there's uh, other possibilities that are there as well. Um, and I think, um, you know, as far as other changes to the item, um, uh, in, in, in answer to Todd's question, um, there, there was an adjustment in the language on the um, uh, 700 megahertz first net spectrum, so that is um, now uh, uh, contemplated as, as potentially part of the proposal. Um, and I th th there were a few other changes, I think, uh, around the edges as well. Um, I, I mean, I think most of them were sort of additional questions that we asked about things. I think we also um, added an additional ban, the AWS H block ban, to the um, uh, to the proposal as well. Thank you. So, if I may, the w w what does it say now about what does the NPRM now say about FirstNet Airways? Um, uh, well, it says it says that it's it's. Uh, being being considered as as potentially part of the proposal, I think there were there was language previously in the item that was released on circulation mm -hmm. that suggested that um, that would not be considered as part of this initial proposal. But um, you know, based on on stakeholder input and other considerations, we adjusted that. So the commissioners, as they, I want to make sure I, I get this right because there are some investors worried about it. That, that, so if I write that the the proposal now. What offers the possibility, or the the agency could could allow could yeah, allow seeks, seeks comment on the potential seeks comment on allowing okay. service yeah. this type of service on FirstNet Airways. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you so much. Any other questions on the item? Okay, thank you. All right. We'll next take our two uh, WCB items on uh, reasonable rates for incarcerated folks and enhancing protections against illegal robocalls. Any questions on these items? Yes. All right. Good morning. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Afternoon. <laughs> so the FCC lied. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, just me. I had delegated authority to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Editorial comments on it. Um, OGC the, just went nuts, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, this, the standard question of what changes were made uh, between the draft items and the items uh, that were approved today, please. Yeah, so on both items, we received uh, feedback from some of the offices, Commissioner Carr on both items, Commissioner Starks on the incarcerated persons item. Uh, we received some feedback from ex partes from stakeholders on the outside, all of them just kind of small tweaks to the item that, um, that you'll be able to see when it comes out, but we're very happy with where they ended up. I am. Yeah. Sure. We good? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, too. No problem. All right, next we will uh, take questions on the report and order on robo text blocking. Questions? Yes. All right, come on up. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I uh, just want everybody to feel part of the proceedings. Um, I, I, again, the, the standard question, any changes or any notable or substantive changes between the, the draft item and what was approved, please? What, what's different? I mean, none that are super, I, I, I think, um, changed the course of, of the item, but happy to, I mean, our, my deputy here is, was involved in that process and happy to have. Yeah, Alejandro is right. We took input from some of the offices. We also got ex partes as we typically do. So some changes in the item when it becomes more public, but no massive changes in the bottom line. And lastly, we'll have um, our media bureau available for questions on today's accessibility item. No questions? Okay, great. I think that concludes uh, today's bureau press call. I believe Commissioner Carr is uh, available um, for press after this. Thanks so much. Hey, good to see uh, all three of you, two, two and a half at, at least. We'll see if we get the, the, the no, at least, yeah, do your thing. Uh, good to be with you guys this month. Um, a lot of interesting developments in the last month or so on a couple of issues that I've cared a lot about. One, obviously, is on the, uh, the TikTok front. There was that report out just yesterday that says that the administration through the Treasury CFIUS process has reached out to TikTok and indicated, at least according to the reports, um, that they either need to divest uh, from the corporate ties back to uh, China, or at least divest the Chinese government uh, ownership entities, or face a possible ban in the U.S. And I think as a general matter, that's a very good development. It's a positive development. I think it further underscores the point that I've been making for several months now, which is that this Project Texas compromise on national security that TikTok has been putting forward and attempting to sell to the administration for a while now is hopefully being treated uh, as the non-starter that it should be treated on. We obviously can't compromise on national security when it comes to TikTok. There's a broad bipartisan consensus now on the national security threats posed by TikTok. Just today, the UK government did a uh, security review and concluded that there are legitimate security reasons that they need to ban TikTok from government devices there as well. So this is an issue that we're seeing uh, globally. India, of course, was one of the first uh, countries to do a total ban of TikTok. So I welcome this news from the, uh, the Treasury Department, at least as reported in the news. I think now uh, the process turns to very quickly completing and closing out that uh, CFIUS review in a way that safeguards U.S. national security interests. Uh, similar, since we last uh, had a press conference, the FCC's <coughs> spectrum authority has lapsed or expired uh, for the first time in its history, I think. There's a lot of reasonable ground for people to uh, have disagreements, different viewpoints on you know, what bands should we move, in what order, what power limits, uh, how do we make sure the federal users have the spectrum that they need to carry out their missions, how do we make sure that uh, private sector has the spectrum that it needs. But as a bottom line, you know, having the FCC spectrum authority lapse uh, jeopardizes our economic leadership it jeopardizes our national security, given the interwovenness between U.S. spectrum leadership uh, and our security. And so I think it's important uh, that we quickly restore the FCC's authority. And I think more broadly, <clears throat> you know, I put out um, a spectrum pipeline uh, set of ideas back in, I believe it was March of 2021, that laid out some concrete steps that we could take here at the FCC in order to continue to move forward on the same pace of spectrum actions that we took in the last administration in a pace that would secure U.S. leadership. And for um, a number of months since then and up to now, I've been concerned that we are starting to hit a stall speed uh, in terms of U.S. leadership on spectrum. I think those concerns are underscored uh, by the lapse in FCC spectrum authority. Now, the administration through NTIA is seeking comment now on um, up to 1,500 megahertz of spectrum that they could identify for their pipeline initiative. Um, frankly, though, this is something that we should be doing uh, at the FCC. Again, as I mentioned, I've put forward my own ideas on specific bands that we should be moving on over a specific time period. Um, 
so I do think we need to sort of get back to um, exerting greater leadership when it comes to uh, wireless in this country. Um, more broadly, I think it's important that we continue to you know, stand up for the decisions that Congress made long ago about the role that the FCC should be playing on all of these issues. If you look at um, universal service issues, funding issues, for instance, a lot of the new funding decisions and the new funding itself is being run through uh, Commerce at NTIA. You've got Commerce NTIA running this new uh, Spectrum Pipeline initiative. Uh, and I do think as, a, as an institutional matter, it's important that we continue to stand up for the decisions that Congress made, that the FCC is the lead agency when it comes to, on the spectrum side, spectrum decisions, and we've got a uh, long and successful track record on uh, universal service and funding initiatives. And I think it's important that we continue to stand up and have the FCC be uh, the lead player on these issues as envisioned by Congress. I think this general movement of um, authority and leadership from the FCC inside of the administration, regardless of the politics of the administration, is not in either the institutional interests of the FCC, but more importantly, not, in my view, consistent with the statutory cuts that Congress has made in terms of the allocation of leadership on these issues. With that, happy to open it up to questions you all may have. Uh, Commissioner, thanks much. Uh, your thoughts on the ALJ denying the uh, motion to certify vis-a-vis standard, -vis standard Tegna? Yeah, I just I saw the, the the flash of that news come across while I was uh, at the open meeting, but haven't had a chance to to do a deep dive on it yet. Well, again, I haven't looked at that particular uh, ruling yet. Obviously, you know, stepping back as a general matter, it's it's hard to identify uh, a merger of this size that has gone through the HDO process and ultimately reached from the merging party's perspectives a, a timely uh, favorable decision. And I think that's, you know, uh, very well known. As I said, you know, I put out a statement at the time saying that I think that this should be something that we look at at the full commission. Uh, obviously, there's that, that didn't happen in this particular case. Um, and we'll see where it goes from here. Hi, Commissioner. Also on spectrum auctions. Um, so I just want to be clear, are you not in favor of the rounds bill to extend to September 30? Or in favor of the Rogers bill for a short term extension? Yeah, I was I know. specifically not speaking to the merits of either one of those approaches that as I mentioned, I think you can have reasonable people having, you know, different views on specific megahertz that should be for commercial, specific megahertz that should be for federal users, um, and those are reasonable debates to be had. I leave it to Congress to sort out um, the timeline on how long the FCC's auction authority uh, should be uh, brought back for. Uh, I defer entirely to those discussions between senators, um, so I'm not weighing in at all as between those bills. My point is just stepping back to a broader point that it is important, regardless of which way you go on that particular issue, that we restore the FCC's auction authority because it's vital for our not just economic leadership, but also our national security leadership. Thanks. Todd, anything from you over there? All right. Thanks, all. Appreciate it. Thanks.